Welcome to this United States history lecture on money. Ooh, money, 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 money. Um, we're actually going to look at the money problem between 1870 and 1895 because you have to understand it in, to under, in order to understand the populist party movement, which is going to be our next lecture. So 6.03 is the target for this lecture. And now let's talk. Hey, must be. First thing we need to talk about are greenbacks. During the Civil War, the North, the United States, the Union printed greenbacks. This was a form of paper money with a green back. How clever is this name, right? What are we going to call this? What's well, got green on the back? I know greenbacks. Brilliant. This paper money um, helped to fill in uh, the gap for folks to get access to money um, because it's hard to get access to gold and silver all the time, especially in time of war. So the job of paper money is to increase the money supply. Um, instead of having to use gold and silver coins, you can use these pieces of paper and treat them with as if they have value, just like a gold and silver coin. But the problem is the value of them would not be stable. Paper is not inherently as valuable as gold. No one looks at a piece of paper and goes, oh my gosh, look at this paper. It is worth so much money. Gold, on the other hand, yeah, we value gold a lot because it's scarce, unlike paper, which is pretty plentiful. The value then of this paper money fluctuated. It went up, it went down. The only thing giving it value was the belief that the United States government would back that money up. At some point, you'd be able to get away from paper and go back to gold and silver, and the US government would say, okay, we'll give you this much gold or this much silver for it. Um, so you really, when you're using paper money, you're kind of depending on the US government's strength and its economic power to believe that this money has any value. And eventually, when they take it out of circulation, it's no longer being used, you believe that it will have some kind of value that can translate back into um, gold and silver. Lots of people liked greenbacks, but none so much as farmers, workers, and debtors. The poorest people um, in America loved paper money. It was more easy to get than gold and silver coins. So paper money made their lives a little bit easier, even if it wasn't worth as much. Here is the back of an 1862 greenback. I wasn't lying to you. It is definitely green on the back. It said this note is a legal tender for all debts, public and private. Uh, just like our money today and the United States, you can see the name down here, is going to back up the value of this. Um, until they decide they no longer want to use it and they're going to pull it out of the economy. So how does this paper money work? So paper money works based on faith. I know that seems like a scary thing to believe in. I believe this money is worth $10, but that's a dollar bill. Shut up. I have faith. The faith is your belief that this paper money can be used to buy goods with it. And when you go to the store, you believe that you can take a dollar bill and get a dollar's worth of goods. And the person who runs the store also believes that it's worth a dollar. If at any point there becomes a fear that the paper money is not worth as much, or that the US government is not going to back up that paper money in some way, then the public tends to lose a little bit of faith in that. It loses its value. And so a dollar might not buy you a dollar's worth of things anymore. 
This happened in the American Revolution when the United States printed paper money. And by the end of the war, it took 800 of these paper bills to equal one real dollar in value. At the end of the Civil War, a dollar greenback actually only bought 46 cents worth of material. And the fancy term for that is depreciate. It lost its value. And so people were not as trusting. They didn't have as much faith in it as it did at the beginning of the war. Prices rose up. As you might remember from an earlier lecture on the Civil War, inflation did happen in the war and the, the value of goods went up as people were more demanding of them and they became scarce. So when you look at these greenbacks uh, that were issued in the Civil War, by the end of the war, they're not going to be worth as much. So let's think about that logically. Let's imagine that you go into debt when the value of a greenback is 46 cents. So you've taken this dollar greenback, but you've only gotten 46 cents worth of stuff out of it. Let's then imagine that the value of the greenback increases. That means that your debt has increased, but the amount of goods you got has not. Let's say you went and bought a candy bar and you went into debt for that candy bar. So you got, you're going to owe money for that. Well, if you bought it when it was 46 cents and it's now worth 67 cents, your debt for that candy bar has increased. Note to the wise here, don't go into debt for candy bars. That's a bad, bad idea. Don't buy those on credit. But lots of people bought things on credit during the Civil War. And after the war, if the value of the greenbacks went up, that means the value of their debts go up as well. Now, let's imagine that we have a gold-based system. Gold-based systems don't fluctuate in value as much because a government can print as much paper money as it has gold to buy it back. Or it can print less. Sometimes we do see uh, the printing of more paper money than you have gold, but that doesn't happen as often. It's not as uh, smart a move. So gold-based currency systems tend not to fluctuate in value. Uh, the currency has a stable value. Your debts have a value that doesn't change as very much when you bought something in a gold-based system. So imagine it like this. An amount of gold is equal to so much paper money and that really doesn't change in value as long as you don't lose any of this gold or somebody doesn't steal it. So $300 in gold gets you $300 in paper bills as long as you have enough gold to back up those bills. So we've got two systems going on here. You can have a system where you have paper money that's not backed by anything you can have a system where the money is backed by gold. Hmm. Which one do you think is going to be more popular with ordinary people? Which one's going to be more popular with wealthy people? Well, let's make that even more complicated. You don't have to rely just on gold. You can also use silver. Since silver is a precious metal and uh, it is valued, there's more of it, so it's not as valued as much as gold. But you could use silver coins instead of gold or silver coins and gold to back your paper money. If that's the case, then you can have silver and gold and it will get you more money in your economy since you can use this other metal to print more paper.
So gold plus silver equals mo money. Of course, mo money, mo problems. That's going to set up a debate over silver in the 19th century. Many debtors, farmers, and workers wanted to see more silver in the U.S. money supply. They wanted more silver because it could be used to generate more paper, or if there's not gonna be paper money floating around, more silver still increases the money supply by itself. So let me say that again. If you've got a money supply that's only gold, that means there's not as much money floating around, its value's pretty stable. If you add silver to that, that means there's more money floating around. And if you added even paper to that, paper money backed by silver and gold, that would increase the money supply even more. Why would you want to increase the money supply? Well, think about it. If you're a poor person and you are trying to get a hold of money to pay your debts, if there's only gold, you're probably not going to see gold very often because there just isn't that much of it. Great, the value of gold's pretty stable, but there's not a whole lot circulating around. If you add in silver, that does mean there's more money floating around, but its value is less because there's a rule in economics that says the more you have of something, the less it's worth. We could then throw in paper, and paper would increase the money supply too, but then the value of that money would also be less. How does this play out in American politics? Well, in 1873, there was a crime against silver. The United States government stopped using silver. Momentarily, they would start again. And at that moment, people who mined silver in the West got angry because then nobody's buying their silver. But debtors also got angry because it lowered the money supply and it made it harder for them to get money. So that's the trade off. More money circulating, the less it's worth. Less money circulating means it's harder for people to get money. In 1878, the United States government resumed using silver. So temporarily, more money was put into the U.S. money supply, and debtors went, yay, more money. Rich people went, boo, our value of money has gone down. Shame. And in 1890, Another act increased the purchasing of silver for increasing the money supply. So Western miners went, yay, they're buying our silver. Debtors went, yay, more money in the money supply. Meanwhile, wealthy folks are getting angrier. They would prefer a completely gold-backed economy. They don't want paper money. They don't want silver. Those who supported gold felt like a smaller money supply meant that the prices and the value of money would be stable. So if you had $60 million in a gold-backed economy, it's pretty much going to be $60 million because the value of your money is going to be stable. The wealthy people benefit from a very stable supply like this. The gold and silver and even paper money folks believe that because silver is more abundant, it would create a larger money supply. And if there's more money, it's easier to get money. The problem, of course, is prices change more often. If the value of your money fluctuates and a dollar isn't really worth a dollar anymore, 
then sometimes you only get 60 cents worth of goods out of it. But in the end, this still benefits debtors, the poor, and farmers as long as it doesn't go too far. It can go too far and lead to a problem known as hyperinflation that we'll be talking about much later. So we've got two political ideas um, in conflict here over money in the United States. Some people just want gold and only gold. Some people want gold and silver. Some people are saying gold and silver and paper money. And this is putting wealthy folks in contrast to much poorer people. Now, I went ahead and calculated the money supply at this time period per person. This is an average. So when I say that there's $30 per person in 1865, it doesn't mean that everybody has 30, 30 bucks. It just means there's 30 bucks floating around in the economy for every human being in the United States at this time. Of course, that 30 bucks is not worth as much as 1870. You can see in 1870, there's less than 20 bucks per person floating around in the economy. But each of those dollars is worth more because there's fewer of them. It dips to a real low in um, 1875 of about $17 per person and then starts steadily rising again as silver is introduced into the economy. In 1895, um, it reaches somewhere around $24 per person, but it will never go back to the Civil War amount. Keep in mind, this is just circulating per person. There are people in America this time of way more than $30. So this is just an average. So let's look at how this affects farmers specifically. Farmers between 1870 and 1900 faced a lot of problems in the United States. For one thing, banks foreclosed on them. Farmers were in debt at higher rates than industrialists were. More farmers were losing their farms than factories were closing. And farmers look at that situation and go, oh, if only I had more money, I could pay for my farm. I could pay my bills. Railroads charged high fees to ship goods. So when you took your corn down to the railroad to ship it to market, um, you would be paying a lot of money for that. And if money is not circulating, if there's not a lot of it, how are you going to get the money to pay those uh, shipping fees. There's another problem, and this is a problem farmers themselves created. Crop prices dropped because farmers were drastically overproducing. Out west, the more people you had farming meant the more wheat you made, which meant the value of wheat dropped. The value of corn dropped. And this is a problem we call oversupply. There's just too much. The farmers were doing what they thought was right. They went out and plowed the land, produced as much corn and wheat as they could, took it to the market, and hoped to make enough money to pay their bills. But if every farmer is doing that, there's going to be a whole heck of a lot more wheat and corn out there than the market can deal with. So look at all these money problems that farmers faced. Um, not being able to pay their bank loans, not being able to pay for shipping goods, and not making money because they're producing too much wheat and corn and other farm products. These are all money-related problems, and I think you can see where this is now headed. As farmers produce more and prices go down, farmers think what can we do about money and our access to money and getting more money? For one thing, 
farmers did understand that some of their problems had to do with modernizing American life. They realized that technology was changing the way people farmed. They realized that the more they bought modern equipment, the more it made corn and wheat, except they felt trapped in that cycle. You couldn't just voluntarily as a farmer go, you know what, I'm just not gonna farm this year. Meanwhile, your neighbors were continuing to farm. More machinery meant that a farmer could produce more by himself without help. At the same time, that meant prices would drop. It also meant he didn't need to hire extra workers for his farm. So you've got a whole bunch of people who don't need to uh, work on farms anymore. Well, what jobs are they gonna have? Many of them will move to cities and end up working in factories. We can see this in a chart where it shows the percent of the US workforce in farm labor. In 1840, almost 70% of Americans worked on a farm. 1860, it's below 60%, 1880, it's about 50%, and by 1900, it's under 40%. The opposite meaning 60% of Americans don't work on farms. And why? Well, because if you have a machine that does the work for you, you don't need to hire people to come harvest your wheat or your corn. So farmers knew that some of the problems they faced were dealing, were related to technology and to modernization of, of farming, but what could they do about that? And you, I know you and I are probably thinking, gosh, if they could only cooperated and gotten together and reduced how much of the crops they were making, well, that's a huge coordination problem um, that's hard to get everybody on the same page with. So they looked at their problems and thought, okay, money is our problem. Money is really the one thing we can fix. So we need to tackle the money issue. We need to tackle the railroad issue and stop letting the railroads drive all over us. We need to tackle the banking issue. We need to figure out how we can organize farmers to deal with the problems that they're facing in the United States, where railroads and industries are making money, but farmers are not. And if money is the core problem, how are they going to solve it? That answer we'll look at in another lecture.